right, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event, uh, webinar, webcast, whatever you want to call us. Uh, we're online and we're every week. <laughs> um, where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. Uh, the show is free and open to anyone to watch both our live shows and our recordings. The live show is done <coughs> excuse me, um, every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. And then the recordings are posted onto our website, so you can watch them. If you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. <coughs> Excuse me. You can always go to our website and watch them there. And we do a mixture of things here, presentations, book reviews, mini training sessions. Um, as I said, anything library related, we are happy to have it on the show. We bring in guest speakers sometimes, and sometimes we have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff. And that's what we have this morning to my left is uh, Emily <laughs> Nimsikant, who is the uh, cataloging librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Hello. And she's been on quite a few times before doing um, various cataloging related sessions for catalog, mainly for catalogers, <laughs> yeah, uh, to um, keep them up to speed on things. But I, I never worked as a cataloger myself, but I know even when you're working in a library and as a cataloger, you do need to have some sort of knowledge of what's going on so you know what's happening behind the scenes. Or you, maybe you're just curious about what's happening behind the scenes. So um, Emily's got this session for us today. Uh, resource description and what? RDA for non-catalogers. If you've heard this acronym <laughs> and you're not a cataloger and you don't even have a clue or you know what it means, but you're not really sure what it's going to mean to me, um, this would be the session for you. So I will just hand it over to you, Emily, and you can use the mouse or the keyboard. Either one should work. Great. All right. Thanks, Krista. Um, and thank you to all of you for attending. Um, as Krista said, this is RDA for non-catalogers. So if you literally are thinking resource description and what when you hear it, <laughs> this is for you. Um, if you've heard of it, but you're maybe not totally clear on how it's going to affect library catalogs, this session is for you, too. Um, I chose this graphic for the slide because I'm presenting just the tip of the iceberg here. <laughs> We're not going to go too deep. You don't have to worry about drowning. Um, I'm not going to throw a bunch of mark tags at you. Um, this is definitely for people who do not catalog on a daily basis and just kind of want to get the big picture about what the heck we're talking about when we talk about RDA. Mm -hmm. There we go. So speaking of, we will start by what the heck is RDA? Maybe you've heard this acronym, catalogers mumbling about it mysteriously. Um, to answer that in the most simple, simple form, um, RDA stands for Resource Description and Access. It is a cataloging code, a set of cataloging rules or guidelines designed to replace uh, the Anglo-American cataloging rules, second edition, or AACR2 for short, which have been in effect since 1978-ish. Um, oh, uh, yeah. Before our time. Yes, I think, yeah, they were written Library about 78 and yeah. implemented about 1980. Um, so RDA, the new rules, were implemented by the National Libraries on March 31st, 2013. Um, when I say National Libraries, I mean the Library of Congress, the National Library of Medicine, um, the National Agricultural Library. And so a lot of libraries around the country followed suit when that happened. And even if you um, aren't necessarily a library that's creating original RDA records, if the Library of Congress is doing it and you import records from the Library of Congress and capture cataloging, that's you have idea. RDA stuff in your catalog. Mm -hmm. So it's important to be aware. Um, a few more things to know about RDA and kind of the purposes behind it. Um, it is designed with the user in mind. Um, as we'll see, it's based on a conceptual model that is based off of user tasks, what our library users actually want to do with our catalogs. Um, it's designed to describe all types of resources. AACR2 was very, very book-centric. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, we have a lot of stuff that isn't books in our catalogs now. So um, RDA is designed to work better for describing things that aren't books. Um, and it's also designed to make library data work better with other data on the web. Um, we are not, libraries are not the only people providing bibliographic information these days. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things about how our data currently works that doesn't really play nicely with other information out there. So it still kind of remains to be seen exactly how well RDA accomplishes this, but it, one of the goals is to make our data work better with other data out there. Um, I said it, it was designed with the user in mind, and I'm going to kind of just dip our toes into the model that it's based on that is supposed to be based on user tasks. Um, RDA is based on a conceptual model called FERBER. Um, that stands for Functional Requirements for Bibliographic Records. 
And yes, I realize I'm getting a little bit acronym heavy here. Um, That's what we do. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> Librarians and catalogers in particular, we love our acronyms. Um, I have up there on the slide a comic that I actually have on my office door here at work. Um, you may not believe there are cataloging comics out there, but uh, Maya Gosling is a librarian who has done several. Um, I've on her blog and she has a lot of really funny comics. And so when her library was going through RDA training, she posted some comics related to that. So the trainer was saying AACR2 is being replaced by RDA, which is based on Berber. The fraud model used with WEMI entities should complement Prasar Grink and And then says, oh, sorry, I'm just making stuff up now. And that's what it feels like sometimes. <laughs> so if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the acronyms, don't worry, you're not alone. Even catalogers make fun of this stuff. But it is important that you know at least the basics of Ferber, so you can understand why we're doing some of the RDA changes. I remember when Ferber first came on the scene. Yeah, and it's been around for a yeah. lot longer than RDA. I yeah. think 98 or some of the 2000, yeah. somewhere around there. So Ferber has been out there for a while. And Ferber is not cataloging rules. It doesn't tell you what kind of information, but it's just kind of a conceptual, big picture. This is why we're doing this, and these are the different parts and how they relate to each other. Um, there are four different levels in Ferber. Um, in that last slide, one of the acronyms that were on WEMI, W-E-M-I, that one is actually real. Um, and those are sort of the ways of thinking about the items that we're cataloging from abstract to concrete. Work, expression, manifestation, and item. So work is kind of the idea of a book or a movie or whatever as it existed in the author's head, even before it was written down or made concrete in any way. So say like Tale of Two Cities, when Charles Dickens thought about it, that was a work. Um, expression gets a little bit more concrete. Um, it still doesn't refer to any particular physical um, instance of something you have in your catalog, but um, the example I usually see given for expressions is that different translations are different expressions. So when Charles Dickens wrote A Tale of Two Cities in English, that's an expression, and if it was translated into French, that's a different expression. It still doesn't matter if it's the English version is published by Penguin or Random House, that's that's manifestation level, that's coming later, but different expressions are different ways of kind of representing that work. Then when we get to manifestation, the M in WEMI, um, that is talking about a particular physical edition of something, so the Penguin edition of Tale of Two Cities versus the HarperCollins edition. Every single copy of that is an example of a manifestation. And then when you get to item, that is the actual, um, the most physical, concrete way of representing a book you could have. One particular physical item is an item, something you can hold in your hand, something you can use as a doorstop. That is what we talk about when we talk about items. So these are all kind of ways of thinking about, you know, for example, we, we use the word book. You know, what exactly are we talking about? You can say, oh, I've read that book when you are talking about Tales of Two Cities, and you don't mean that you've read that exact one physical copy sitting in someone's hand. You mean you've read yeah, the story, the story, the work, so to speak. But, or you can mean that book over there needs to be reshelved, and that's, you know, a physical item. So these are kind of four different levels of thinking about things in our catalog. And Ferber talks about these various levels and the relationships between them and the relationships that creators of these things have to them. Ferber is all about relationships. And here is yeah. a potentially scary looking chart <laughs> that, that talks about those relationships. Um, the big square in the middle, the group one entities, those are the things I was just talking about, work, expression, manifestation, and item. Um, and again, those arrows are relationships. So if you take nothing else away from this, remember that Ferber is about relationships, because we'll come to back to that later when we're talking more about RDA. Um, the group two entities are things that create these works, expressions, manifestations, or items. So people, families, corporate bodies, those are group two. They create the stuff that we have in our library collections. And then group three is the subjects. Think of subject headings. Anything that something is about goes in group three. So those are the very, very basics of what the heck RDA is. So why are we doing this? This is a pretty big change. and. Why is it necessary? Well, my short answer to that question is always, it's not the 1970s anymore. <laughs> our clothes have changed in the 1970s, and our cataloging rules have changed. Like I said, ASER 2 was written in 1978, published in 78, and kind of slowly implemented, I think, official day one was 1980, so it's been a while. A lot of things are different. Our catalogs have changed. When ASER 2 was in its heyday, we had card catalogs. 
And so, you know, if you wanted to go look up something, you would have to flip through the files. And if you wanted to look up something by subject, you'd go to a different drawer. And if you wanted to look up something by author, you go to a different drawer. And now we have online electronic computerized catalogs. And so things function totally differently. We have keyword searching. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to know the exact author's name when you're starting with. You can kind of guess at it and do a keyword search. And so the concept of main entry is not necessarily as important as it was. So one big reason for RDA is that, you know, we need to change things based on what our catalogs are like. You know, a lot of RDA, of ASR2 was based on the cat card catalog environment. You know, there's a lot of abbreviations in there because we had to save space because we're typing on these little tiny 3x5 catalog cards. Um, so, you know, we just don't need to do that stuff anymore. Also, the things we catalog have changed. Um, a DVD, a streaming video online, these things did not exist in 1978. Um, ASR 2, I mentioned that it's book-based. Um, mm -hmm. It does have provisions for other types of items, but each other type of item has its own chapter. There's a chapter for continuing resources. There's a chapter for electronic resources. Mm -hmm. Anytime anything new came along that we hadn't been cataloging before, you need to have a whole chapter, basically, and that's really mm -hmm. labor-intensive. Um, so they did have different things, like we had albums, like uh -huh. vinyl albums uh -huh. were in the, in the libraries yeah. at so, that point. Yeah, yeah. we weren't, yeah, we weren't, we, even back then we weren't doing yeah. only books, but right. our rules still were very heavily based on books. Yeah. And then you had to kind of reinvent the wheel every time you got something new. You had to add a whole chapter onto it. Um, so the things are continuing to change, so we want to kind of avoid that, you know. There will be things out there in 30 years that we're cataloging that are as foreign to us as streaming video would be to a cataloger in 1978. So we want to allow for things to change without having to completely rewrite our rules. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, RDA, anything in there applies to basically anything you could catalog. There are a few exceptions. You know, some rules will say this is just for musical scores or this is just for maps, things that just clearly do not apply to everything. But for the most part, it's meant to be guidelines for cataloging anything you could possibly think of. And as I said before, the information universe has changed. We are not the only players in the game when it comes to bibliographic information or reference information in general. You know, people don't have to come to a reference desk and ask you know, a basic factual question. They can use Google. Um, even to find out about books, they don't have to come to the library. There's Amazon out there. You know, publishers have their own um, information on books. And so there's just, there are new possibilities that exist as far as kind of a two-way street. You know, our information can be used to inform these sources and get reliable information out there. And possibly, you know, we could make use of data from publishers or Amazon and import them into our catalogs and kind of go both ways. You know, a lot of people use, you know, book covers from like library thing and, you know, just there are lots of other resources out there and we want to have a model that allows us to make use of those other sources and provide our information to those other sources. And RDA is supposed to help us do that. So those are kind of the basics. What is RDA? Why are we doing this? Now let's get kind of into the nuts and bolts of what is different now. If you're looking at a catalog record or a library catalog in general, what will you notice with RDA records that is different from AACR2 records? Well, for one thing, there are fewer abbreviations. As I mentioned, we don't have to constrain ourselves to catalog cards anymore. So if you're used to ASCR2 records, you may be used to seeing things like this with pages abbreviated, P period, um, color and illustrations are both abbreviated. And with RDA, those are spelled out. Um, I will point out that centimeter is still <laughs> what you might think of as abbreviated. Um, if you really don't want to get into nerdy cataloguries, <laughs> please shut your ears now. But <laughs> for those who may wonder, um, it has been determined that the CM is not actually an abbreviation, it's a symbol. Oh. And this is not catalogers being nerdy, this is scientists being nerdy. Apparently, according to the international scientific community, this is across the board, CM is not an abbreviation, it's a symbol. So okay. we continue to use CM even though um, everything else is spelled out. Mm -hmm. um, and you also notice you don't necessarily automatically put a period at the end of it. Mm -hmm. That was always um, punctuation that came from ASCR2 rather than mm -hmm. already or the rules itself. So um, you don't necessarily have to. There are exceptions based on whether or not there's a series heading in the record, and that's going way down deep below the tip of the iceberg, so I'm going to stop <laughs> right there. But just take away, there are fewer abbreviations in RDA. Um, here's another example. 
ASR2, with its considerations for catalog cards, had a few abbreviations that were standardized regardless of what was actually on the item you're cataloging. With RDA, the main guiding principle is to represent whatever actually appears on the item. So in an addition statement that goes in the 250 field in a mark record, that's what the 250 there means, um, if it actually says third revised edition spelled out on the item, under ASR2 you would make three abbreviations. You would put the numeral in for third, you would do REV period for revised, and you would do ED period for edition. With RDA, you just take what you see. So in a lot of ways, RDA is really easier for, for new catalogers, I would say, people who aren't changing over from um, ASAR2, you don't really have to think about whether you're supposed to abbreviate something, you just do whatever is on the item. Um, in that second example, the addition statement has second with the numeral, so that's how you do it under RDA. Um, it has an addition abbreviated, so you abbreviate that under RDA, but revised is spelled out, so you spell that out under RDA whether where you would have um, abbreviated it under ACR2. So if you start seeing slightly longer looking records with fewer abbreviations, um, that's why. Again, this kind of goes back to RDA and Ferber's um, emphasis on user needs. You know, mm -hmm. it's probably it's easier. easier for yeah. patrons to understand what the heck you're talking about. Instead of trying to translate uh -huh. the abbreviations, like E N L, I'm not sure. Yeah, you would what, what I even know that means enlarged. Yeah, what that means <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, kind of take what you see and you know make it easier for patrons to read. Another difference you'll notice is that the rule of three is gone, and if you're not a cataloger, maybe you don't necessarily know what the rule of three means, but you probably do realize its effects. Um, if there are more than three authors under AACR2, you would only include the first author's name. Again, we're saving space for catalog cards here. Um, so you would only include the first author's name, and then you would put the Latin abbreviation at all in brackets. Um, I sometimes joke that with RDA, I'm a little bit disappointed because I don't get to use the Latin that I took in college anymore, <laughs> but <laughs> I think I'll learn to live with that. Again, easier for patrons to understand. Um, under RDA, if there are more than three authors, you still go ahead and include them all. Um, there are optional exceptions for, you know, if you have something with 18 authors and your catalogers just don't have time to include them all, you can substitute an abbreviation, um, but we're not doing Latin again, it would say Susan Brown and for others in brackets. So again, much more understandable for the patrons. Mm -hmm. And so you can make exceptions if you just don't have time to include all the other um, authors' names. In some of the training I've been doing on RDA, I um, leaned heavily on training slides from um, Cambridge University in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And they would, all their slides would say, you know, their local policy is, you know, transcribe all names unless unduly onerous. <laughs> it just sounded so British, but <laughs> that's, you know, you make your local call as to what is too much work for your catalogers, basically. Um, as I've kind of referred to, the Latin terms are gone. Um, this does not just apply to the rule of three, but also, um, for example, in the publication information. Previously, under AACR2, if you did not know where something was published, you would use the abbreviation S period, L period, sine loco without a place, showing off my Latin again. <laughs> um, and if you do not know the name of the publisher, you would use S period, N period, sine nomine without name. Um, with RDA, you're supposed to use these big long phrases, place of publication not identified, publisher not identified. Um, again, probably easier for users to understand what the heck it means. There have been some critiques that it takes up a lot more space and you know, with people using mobile devices, maybe it's not as user friendly as it tries to be, but you know, I would hope that maybe if you were developing a mobile interface, you could substitute something like an icon or something that would might make it a little bit more, or just you know, don't have that information available on the very first result screen or something like that. I think there are workarounds, but that is one critique of RDA is that the lack of abbreviations does make it a little bit unwieldy for mm -hmm. smaller mobile devices. Yeah, we do have a question mm -hmm. that relates to this, and I think the previous slides too. Um, the information, you said you take this information coming from whatever it says in the document, and uh -huh. they want to come coming from where on the item, the cover versus... Oh, that's a good question. Um, um, generally, under RDA, it stays the same as AACR2. Under AACR2, they would say the chief source is usually the title page. Um, RDA gives you more flexibility as to kind of substitute sources. If you don't have a title page for whatever reason, they basically say you can use 
they're a little bit more flexible. First of all, they call them preferred sources instead of chief source, so it just sounds a little bit more flexible. We would prefer you to take it from the title page, but if, if not, yeah, there's a lot of wiggle room in RDA, a lot of catalogers' judgment. So um, there is a whole list of order of preference. Um, title page is first, but then um, things like cover or spine or running title, those are all listed in order of preference in RDA. So for a book, and again, it varies based on the type of object, of mm -hmm. course, but for a book, title page is still preferred, but they give you some more flexibility. You know, you can even go to outside reference sources if for some reason it doesn't actually appear on the item itself, but you have a website that from the publisher or whatever where it gives the title. So that's a good question. Possibly one of the most noticeable differences about RDA is that the GMD is gone. Um, GMD stands for General Material Designation, and even if you don't know what the heck that means, um, it's, you probably would recognize it in a list of search results. Um, it's the bracket inf information in the title that conveys the type of the material. So if you get you type in the title of, I don't know, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and you get back one that says electronic resource in brackets after it, and one says sound recording, and one says video recording. That's the GMD, and it's supposed to be kind of a signpost to let you know what type of item you're getting back. So you know if you want the print version, or the ebook version, or um, a DVD, or something like that. This has been replaced by three different elements in RDA. Content type, media type, and carrier type. And the intent behind this is to kind of be able to get a little bit more specific. Um, with the GMD having to choose just one word, um, you know, it, it gets a little bit fuzzy sometimes. Some of them refer to the actual physical item. Some of them refer to kind of more of the content type of video recording. doesn't really tell you what physical type of object it is. Um, also, there are some items where more than one thing could apply. Um, these three elements can be repeated, whereas with the GMD you just had to choose one. Um, for example, uh, a playaway. Is it a sound recording or is it a computer resource? Um, and yes. so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I don't, like, there were probably, there were working groups who had to make a decision that we were going to call them all sound recordings, but really, you know, a lot of patrons would benefit from knowing their electronic resources too. Or a streaming video. Is it a video recording or is it an online resource? Well, it's both. So with these, they can be repeated. Um, you know, there were some kind of, I've had some examples of terminology here. These come from a list of terms listed in the RDA rules, and they're not necessarily the everyday language that people would think of it. Um, here's another RDA uh, comic. Um, two catalogers, one asked them, are you doing anything fun this weekend? Well, I thought I'd go see a two-dimensional moving image. Uh, a movie. I mean a movie. So, you know, when you get into these terms for the content media and carrier types, you start to feel like you're speaking a totally different language that our users won't understand. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about what each of these things are. The content type basically is kind of an abstract of what the heck this thing is without talking at all about the physical carrier. So a text, a print book, and an ebook both have the content type of text. They're both words you read, whether it's in print or electronic format. So content type doesn't deal at all with the physical aspect of an item. Media type gets a little bit more specific. Um, it deals with kind of how you interact with something. So video items, whether it's a DVD or a streaming video, and these two examples, they have both have the same media type of video, even though they're physical. Um, aspect is different. And carrier type, again, these same two items, they would have the same media type, but they have different carrier types. Um, the carrier type for a DVD would be video disc, and the carrier type for a streaming video would be online resource. So this tells you a little bit about how you actually interact with something physically. I will say that I think these are not currently made the best use of. Um, a lot of times they just kind of sit in the record. Um, as you can see, this one over here has content type text, media type unmediated, carrier type volume. That all means this right here is a book. Um, and most library patrons or even librarians are not necessarily going to know what that means. Um, this one over here, the content type is cartographic image, the media type is unmediated, which basically just means you don't need a special device in order to view it. You can just pull it in your hand and interact with it. And a carrier type is sheet. All of that is to say this here is a map. So 
it's not as succinct as having that GMD right there in the title field. I guess those are kind of the two complaints about it. One, that it's not right there in your 245 field, which can, your title field, um, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, I've always thought it was a little bit incongruous because it's not title it's information, not title, no. <laughs> but it is right there in your search results, which is a nice thing for people to kind of have a signpost saying, hey, this is an ebook or this is a map. Mm -hmm. So, and then, yeah, the other um, complaint is that people don't know what the heck this stuff means. <laughs> um, I'm hoping that... I would have known what unmediated means. Yeah, yeah especially, yeah. Just what just the heck does unmediated yeah. mean? So, yeah, it just means you don't need anything fancy to deal with this. You just hold it in your hand and read it. Um, so I'm hoping that um, these will be used more in the future to maybe do like faceted search results. You can limit it down. You, you type in a term and then you see on the side if you want something electronic, click yeah. here. If you want a print book, click here. Um, some catalogs already do this. You know, worldcat.org, they do that. But hopefully this will make it easier. Um, or maybe there'll be icons, you know, text plus unmediated plus volume all adds up to an icon that looks like a book. Mm -hmm. um, cartographic image plus unmediated plus sheet all adds up to something that represents map. And so, that, and those can be included in um, search results. Some people are trying to do some things more like the GMD. Um, this is the Oregon State Library catalog. Um, so they have taken, I think, the carrier type, so the most physical representation of what an object is, and they put it right there in the search results next to the title, kind of like what the GMD used to do. Online resource shows up. This is, yeah, these are all, oh, video desk down here. There's a different one. And these slides will be available later so you can look at them more closely because oh, yeah. I know that these are probably not that easy to read. <laughs> but so this is kind of gives the same overall visual effect of the GMD. So a lot of people have been complaining about the GMD being gone. And so some people are trying to um, alleviate those complaints with the workarounds. The thing about RDA is that it doesn't say at all how to display this stuff. It just tells you what information to put in your record and kind of leaves the display up to your local system, mm -hmm. which is kind of the direction we were moving anyway. So you know, a lot more local control. Uh -huh. You can customize it to what your system exactly. does or and what you, you want it to do. Move pieces of information around as you need to. And again, mm -hmm. ASCR2 was very locked into the catalog card. It all has to look the same. And so mm -hmm. RDA says a lot less about how things have to display, which is good and bad, I would say. <laughs> um, some catalogs, they are again using that carrier type. You know, once you know they had that list of results, once you actually click into the item record, sometimes they'll have a format field and you'll see this is volume, which again for a book is not extremely intuitive. Um, it works a lot better with online resource. So they have added that carrier type to the record. You know, instead of displaying all three and having people go, I don't know what the heck a text unmediated volume is. At least volume makes slightly more sense, or online resources especially, makes more sense. Um, having these things for text items at all is something different under ASCR2. It was kind of understood that for a book you didn't use the GMD at all. Um, so it's, it's seeing something like volume for a book is taking some getting used to. So for that one, someone has a question that might huh? relate to here, wants to know, so what would a DVD look like? Um, what, what would their... Let's see, it would have... Let me go back to some of the list of terms here. Let's see. Yeah, well, the content type would be two-dimensional moving image. That is probably the least understandable uh, yeah. thing you could see. Um, <laughs> the media type would be video, and the carrier type would be video disc. So, uh, again, video the video disc. media type would have VHS, DVD, um, streaming video, things like that, and then video disc would be the carrier type. Let's see, we saw it in one of the search results here. Yeah, this one said video disc. Um, you will notice that that still doesn't specify between DVDs and Blu-rays, for example, which was mm. a critique of catalog records under ASCR2. And some people are still wondering why you know you didn't take it an extra step further. I need to know. Right. I'm guessing the rationale behind that would have something to do with formats changing all the time. And, you mm -hmm. know, they figure video disc is a fairly large category and so you can see there at the bottom if you look at the call numbers that they've used they in the call number this library they've mm. they put in parentheses dvd yeah. as part of the to try and at least get the point across we're using video disc because that's what rda says but here's something that will actually tell you what the heck this thing right is. so there's actual DVD. still some work yeah. around needed a lot of people will put in a note field that says dvd mm -hmm. or yeah like the call number like that so and you do need to know the difference between DVD and, and Blu-ray uh -huh. because so you if you don't have a Blu-ray player, <laughs> exactly. yeah, you're you kind of yeah, play it. out of luck if you <laughs> get a DVD. So, yeah, it's 
it's important, and that is one critique of RDA is that they still don't address that issue. But I'm guessing they wanted to be kind of format neutral a little bit to allow for future developments. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Let's see. Um, yes, thanks. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. I hope that answered the question. Another thing that you might notice when you look at um, uh, RDA records is this thing called relationship designators. Um, remember I told you that because it's based on Ferber, relationships are very important in RDA and one of the relationships they emphasize is relationships between creators of a resource and the resource itself and they want to make these very explicit. Um, back under ASDR2 it was kind of assumed that if something's in the title field and something else is in the author field, then that person wrote that book. Um, now they want to make that very explicit, and so there are relationship designators that you will see. Um, for example, after the author's name, it has a relationship designator that tells you author. Um, as you can see, there can be multiple people with the same relationship designator under any given um, resource. And it doesn't just apply to authors. Um, for example, the publisher could be have a relationship as well. Um, in this case, it's um, a program of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and they we call them the issuing body. So these all come from a list of terms in RDA. You don't. Uh, I think you can add ones if you have a relationship that just doesn't exist. Um, but there is a, a, a list to choose from in RDA. Um, it's not just for authors. Um, editor, for example, is another type of relationship designator, but basically we just want to be very specific about how all these people relate to um, this resource. And you'll see, you know, you might in the last screen have thought it was kind of superfluous that we have author and then the author designation, but you'll see that a lot of our systems, you know, code any person as author when really they're the editor. So. Um, um, so the relationship designator does serve a purpose beyond what our systems normally do. Um, you will also see that um, corporate bodies can be considered authors. Um, if you have, for example, a report issued by a government office, um, under certain situations they can be considered as the author. So it might look a little weird, but sometimes you'll see a corporate um, name and then the relationship designator of author. And you can have many, many, many um, people with many, many, many relationship designators under um, one item. You will definitely see this a lot with um, video recordings, films, things like that. You know, there are you know relationship designators for directors, producers, screenwriters, actors, and so on and so forth. And also notice that one person can have multiple roles. Um, Steve McQueen, in this example, is both the director and the producer. Um, John Ridley is both the screenwriter and the producer, so you can assign multiple relationship designators to the same person for a particular resource. So those are kind of, like I said, the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts of what is going to be different now. Um, and you might think looking at it that, well, this isn't that big of a deal. Um, you know, we spent all this money developing this whole new set of rules and we're spelling out abbreviations. That's the big change. <laughs> um, and you know, I admit that a lot of times, you know, it's really easy to get caught up in things like that and kind of miss the forest for the trees. So I always, you know, even when talking to people who aren't necessarily cataloging on a daily basis, I always like to talk a little bit about the big picture, what could come next in the future with RDA. Why are we really doing this? Um, things that were kind of held back by our current MARC environment and things could be more different in the future than they currently are. Um, I like to always point out the concept of so-called Ferberized catalog interfaces. Um, we're seeing some of these now, even if they're not necessarily using um, RDA, but hopefully they'll become more widespread. Um, I would say Ferberized catalogs are basically catalogs in which they try to bring together sort of the more abstract work um, and then give you options to choose the more particular item. So this is um, actually a catalog that I have a link for on the next slide if you're curious about the URL, but um, the Online Audiovisual Catalogers Group, or OLAC, they have done kind of a prototype of working with moving images, so movies. Um, and so if you search for Dracula, you get a result that will bring 
every possible representation of the 1958 version of Dracula together. So you get that as a list number one, and instead of seeing a whole cluttered up list where these might all appear separately, you see there's a 35 fill millimeter film version of it, there's a 16 millimeter film version, there's a couple different VHS versions of it, and but it's all basically the same work. Um, there is the URL for that one, the first one, um, the OLAC Moving Image Discovery Interface. Scarzo is a similar project. It came out of Indiana University, only it deals with music. Um, music in particular, I think, could benefit from a Ferberized catalog because, you know, there are so many different classical pieces that, you know, could appear, you know, one particular piece of music could appear on several different albums. You know, um, a Mozart French horn concerto could be on a compilation of a bunch of different Mozart music, and it could also be on a compilation of a bunch of different French horn concertos. And so, you know, if you want to be able to search for one particular piece of music without knowing the title of the CD, um, you could benefit from a Ferberized interface. Um, another example is Austlit. This is put out by the National Library of Australia, and um, it does require a subscription to actually access the database, but they do have a sample page of sample searches. So if you're curious at all, you can go to that um, link. And I know Krista is collecting all these links that will be available with the recording yep. later. Uh, yeah, so don't worry about trying to write all these <laughs> down or scribble them down. We'll have them all in our delicious account afterwards, so you'll be able to click on all of them there. Because there are some more even messier URLs coming later, so <laughs> definitely yeah, don't worry don't about it. <laughs> don't even okay. try. So Ferberized Catalogs, I think, is something that could be made possible by RDA. I also think that new search options, different ways for people to search our catalog, could be a possibility. Um, what I mean by that, um, if you kind of want to see what I'm talking about in practice, you can always go to Open Library, which is openlibrary.org. And they try, you know, you can type in the name of a book or whatever, but you can also search by author, for example. Um, here is a screenshot of a sample search I did for Jane Austen. And you don't just get a list of things that she has written, although they are here, they're down here, but you get a little bit of a biographical sketch of her, the, uh, her birth and death dates, you get subjects that she wrote about, um, places that are related to her. Just a bunch of items that actually treats the author as an entity rather than just a name on a catalog record. Um, it, you know, again, kind of goes back to Ferber and those relationships. It brings out the relationship for this author to um, a book. And it also kind of ties in various aspects of this author's, um, her life, things about her. So this is facilitated in RDA by richer authority records. They contain lots of information about things like an author's gender, an author's um, associated dates when they lived, um, associated places. So right now, you know, People kind of need to come to our catalogs to a certain extent knowing what they're looking for. Um, you can do a known item search for Jane Austen. Um, but instead, you could come to our catalogs under RDA and search for women authors and then narrow it down by for women authors from England and then narrow it down from women authors from England who wrote in the 1800s and you would discover Jane Austen and a bunch of other people that you might be interested in if you didn't have such a specific interest, if you kind of wanted to be able to noodle around a little bit more and, you know, more creatively interact with our catalog records. So that is something that I'm particularly excited about with RDA. I really hope that future catalog interfaces will make things like that possible. At this point, um, you might be wondering, well, why aren't we doing this now? And the answer is Mark. <laughs> um, machine readable cataloging is the computer format that all of our records are in right now. And it's really pretty restrictive. Um, mainly because nobody else uses it. It's just a librarian thing. Um, we were really ahead of the time in the 1960s when Mark was developed. Nobody else was really doing computer science stuff like this, but we've kind of stayed stuck there in the 1960s, and the computer science web development world has gone way beyond what librarians have done. Um, Mark is based on limited storage space, you know, back when computers couldn't really store what they can now, um, it, and again, it's very library specific, so it's just, it's really limiting. It, it prevents us from being able to see those kind of individual elements of RDA and the relationships between things. And so, work is underway. Um, the Library of Congress is doing a, a project to develop an alternative to MARC. Um, BibFrame is the term you'll hear tossed around, that's kind of an abbreviation for the Bibliographic Framework Transition Initiative. Um, 
it's not really an acronym, but they always put it in all caps like that. I don't totally know why. But bibframe.org is the site to go to if you're interested in this. It is a technology based on linked data, which is another kind of buzzword going around that you might have heard these days. Um, I won't go into that right now because that could be a whole presentation on its own, <laughs> linked data and bibframe and everything. In fact, I think I've done you that presentation been, yeah, before. <laughs> on, yeah. So see the recording of that if you want more information about that. But just know that if RDA seems to be just about things like spelling out abbreviations and including all the authors' names, we are currently being held back by Mark, and there is a, something underway to change the computer coding behind how all this works. So that being said, let's kind of bring this all back a little bit to more practicalities. RDA in your library, what do you need to worry about? Like I said, if you're doing copy cataloging, chances are good that you have RDA records in your catalog. So what will you see differently? What type of things will you have to make decisions about? You might notice things like split authority files. Um, the things I said before about spelling out abbreviations, those don't apply just to bibliographic records. They apply to authority records. Um, a big one is the word department is now spelled out in authority headings. This affected me a lot because I work with state government documents, so anything that used to be DEPT period is now department. And you might be able, depending on your system, to do kind of a global search. Your catalogers might be able to do a global search and replace and you know, change everything and download new authority records from the Library of Congress. But in case they don't have time to get to that or you just have so many authority records you can't do that at the time being, you may have a split authority file. So if somebody was browsing your catalog by corporate author, um, the stuff that is under Department of Roads spelled out would be separate from DEPT of Roads. So be aware of that, that you may need to go through and change authority records in order to avoid this from happening. Um, sometimes, depending on your system, those relationship designators I talk about, those might be enough to cause a split file. Um, I'm lucky in that our catalog here is programmed to recognize that these are relationship designators and not part of an author's name, so it doesn't alphabetize them or take them into account. But some catalogs, you might find out that um, Arthur Conan Doyle's name with a relationship designator after it is considered to be a totally different heading from just his name and birth and death dates on its own. So again, depending on how much your users browse by author name, this may or may not be a big deal, but it's something you probably want to check into. Do a test search and see if you're getting um, things like this, and you may have to take that into account. And unfortunately, we're at the point where if your system can't handle it, you may just have to decide to delete relationship designators for the time being. Um, we're kind of really in a state of flux here where a lot of ILS systems just don't, can't handle all the changes yet. So, but that's something to check for. Do a test search for an author or an author's name with a relationship designator and see if you're getting anything funny like this. Um, things you might notice you might need to make sure that the catalog is indexing and displaying the correct fields. You know, I didn't really get into mark fields too much in this one, um, but one difference with when it comes to mark coding is that under ASCR2 and the old mark records um, publication information used to appear in the 260 field, and now it's in a 264 field. So if your ILS system is only set up to display 260, any record that you have coming in with the 264 field, when it displays to the public, it's going to look like it doesn't have any publication information, which is not a good thing. So you need to either get in there yourself or talk to your IT person and say, hey, I need to make sure that everything that needs to be displayed is being displayed. So, you know, do some test searches, look through and see if you see anything funny where, you know, for example, the publishing information is not displayed. I had to go in to our um, back end of our catalog and make sure that it's considering both 264 and 260 to be a valid publishing field, for example. So this is the front end of those two records, and even though they have different fields, they both display publishing info. Um, if I had not changed it, that one on the left, it would be missing that field entirely. So that is something to keep in mind. Uh, make sure that they're displaying correctly, and if there's any fields you have that are searchable that are affected by this, you want to make sure that you know, if, if your patrons are able to search by publisher, you want to make sure that search is checking for both 260 and 264 fields, for example. Um, you may be curious as to whether you need to convert all of your old ACR2 records to RDA. Um, I would say you definitely don't need to. Um, it's designed to be kind of backwards compatible to work with 
ASR2 records, you know, people with larger collections are obviously not going to have the time to do that. With that being said, there are some vendors that do offer this as a service if you are curious to do this. And I know I've seen presentations from even large academic research libraries where they've gone ahead and, and done this with thousands or millions of records. Wow. So, yeah. Um, again, I don't think it's totally necessary because, again, I think your patrons will be okay if they see one record that has P period and one record that has pages spelled out. Um, I would definitely yeah. prioritize making authority changes before I would um, recommend going through and changing all of your bibliographic records. But Markive and Backstage Library Works both do offer those services, and those are the URLs there for that. Um, MarkEdit is a free program. You can um, download it yourself, and they have a feature they call RDA Helper that will take records and convert them to RDA. So if you wanted to try and do it yourself, again, it's not going to be totally perfect because it's you know all based on algorithms, and you know it probably won't convert everything totally correctly. But if you would like to try converting records, you can do it yourself with Mark Edit. Again, I feel like this is not a totally necessary conversion, but if you want to explore this, those these are the URLs to check out. I told you more ugly URLs are coming, and here they are. We'll have those links later. <laughs> so yeah. please, yeah, do not copy them down. Um, whenever I give presentations, I like to throw a lot more resources at people because I can't possibly cover everything in an hour. And I want to make sure you are exposed to some of the other good resources out there. Um, the first link is a webinar that was given by ALA, their um, technical services division. Um, it's from, I think, 2010, so it's a little bit old, but still I think it covers the basics pretty well. Um, the second link on there is a presentation, or the notes from a presentation that um, Deirdre Rout, a cataloger at Omaha Public Library here in Nebraska, gave to her public services staff. So it's you know the basics of what you as a public services librarian need to know. Um, again, along those lines, an article from 2012, or a blog post, I should say, um, RDA for Public Services. I found that to be a useful resource as well. Um, and RDA, an introduction for reference librarians, again, is another article from 2012. Um, another resource I'll point you towards is the Nebraska RDA Practice Group Wiki. Um, there was a group of us here in Nebraska who, for about a year leading up to the implementation date in March 2013, we got together once a month and practiced creating RDA records. Um, so. As we went along, we kind of collected you know, examples, the stuff we worked through in each session, various resources that we found, presentations that we've given. So our wiki is rdapractice.pbworks.com, and that you don't have to log in to have an account just to view everything there. So that's a good resource. Um, and then the one non-web re resource I will point out here is the RDA workbook. This kind of grew out of the RDA practice group. We had an article published in Library Journal about our group, and we were contacted by a publisher to ask um, if we would be interested in publishing a book based on our experiences and teaching people RDA. So a group of, I think about six or seven of us Nebraska catalogers, we published the RDA workbook, and that is available. Um, ABC Clio is the publisher. I know it's also on Amazon and everything. So I did want to give a little plug for that. And that is basically it. Does anybody have any questions? Um. Yes, we did have one question that came in while you're talking. Um, and that wants to know, was there a precursor to Ferber? Like what would have been oh. considered the thing before that for this similar type of... Ah, that's a good question. Um, I would say no, not explicitly. I think that... That was the first time they really tried The Ferber was kind of like, hey, way. we're doing this anyway, let's make it formal. Um, Ferber is not necessarily a departure from what we've been doing. It's just kind of, you know, let's think about this in a very more concrete uh, manner. They finally decided that it was... We needed to make it more explicit what we the heck we were doing. Um, and thinking about Ferber kind of makes it possible to do things like the more Ferberized catalog they was talking about. But I think it really just kind of makes explicit a lot of things that were kind of floating around in catalogers' heads for a while. That's a good question. Okay. Um, anybody have any other questions? So that about five minutes or so, five or ten minutes left. Um, if, if anybody has any questions, comments, thoughts on the... Uh, RDA or cataloging. <laughs> <laughs> and there's my contact information there, so if you think of something mm -hmm. after the fact, I'm always here to answer questions. Mm -hmm. Well, nothing's coming in right away. Um, thank you very much, Emily. That was good. Um, I've, as I said, we've done multiple sessions. You did on BibFrame and Link Data and a couple of sessions on RDA. So um, 
I've sat in on these now. I'm like a little bit <laughs> here and there. I don't get to use it, like, implement it or anything as actively in my mm-hmm. job as some people might, but um, it's good to know. Oh, we do a thank you. I'm less afraid of RDA Oh, good. Now. That was Jeanette kind of the point. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully all of you are a little Yes, it's afraid. not scary. <laughs> and it actually seems to be just it's overall um, making it easier. Like you said, it's for the user to make uh-huh. it more simple, clean, simple, and also more um, – Flexible, uh-huh. but like yeah. you said, it, you can do more with it. It's not as restrictive as some of exactly. the systems that uh, some of the yeah. Let's hope so. Yeah, done it, so. and you know, I will say, I think yeah, I think it's to be easier for the user, and honestly, I think it's easier for catalogers too. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's a little bit intimidating when you're coming at it from Latin a user too. Exactly, but for <laughs> new catalogers, you know, I teach graduate school library classes, and the first year that I taught RDA. The amount of traffic on discussion boards and you know emails I was bombarded with it went way way down. Yeah. It's easier for new cataloggers to get, so yeah. that's a good thing. All right, all right. Well, no urgent questions have come in just yet, so thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you very much, Emily. Mm-hmm. Um, that will wrap it up for this week's show. Um, the show has been recorded, as I said, so it will be available on um, our website and yeah, later today, <laughs> along with the, all these PowerPoint slides we posted as well to our SlideShare account so you have access to them and all of the links that are mentioned in there um, will be included in our delicious account so you can see them there. So that will wrap up for this morning. Uh, I hope you join us next week when our topic is Teen Tech Time, Remix Fun with Mozilla Webmaker mm-hmm. Tools. Um, the Mozilla Foundation <laughs> has come out with um, some tools that um, people can use to make their own websites, to create um, web pages, all sorts of fun things. And um, Melissa Techman is from uh, elementary school in Virginia. She's going to be joining us on the show to talk about how she's gotten her teens into learning how to do coding and um, using HTML and CSS. That's what you can do with this. They call it Thimble is their online HTML editor you can use. So she's created some programming for the teens. So um, definitely join us next week for that and sign up for any of our other shows. You can see they're all listed here on our website, the upcoming episodes of the topics will be. Our recordings are listed here right below. There's a little archived Encompass Live Sessions link. So that's where you'll be able to go to see all of the recordings of all of our shows going back to the very beginning. Um, we started Encompass Live in 2009. So um, you can go all the way back there and see all of our previous shows are on our archive page. There you go. Um, other than that, we are on Facebook, as you can see here. So if you are a big Facebook user, you can go ahead and click there and like us on our Facebook page. We'll we have announcements when shows are you know, shows are coming, when recordings are available. Um, reminders, you can see here, for when today's show is starting up, so you can um, see that there. If you like us now, you could be the 200th person. <laughs> yeah, somebody, you could be the 200th person to like our Encompass Live page at 199. I hadn't even noticed that. <laughs> We're at 199. So somebody bring us over the top there. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>